space, the final frontier. Those words, spoken by William Shatner as Captain Kirk, introduced TV viewers to Star Trek and a universe of the future where interplanetary travel was routine. And we encountered all sorts of previously unknown beings other than humans. Mr. Spock, the first officer on the Starship Enterprise, was from the planet Vulcan. Its people had long before forsaken emotions for pure logic. Being half human, Spock struggled with that at times, but held himself to a high standard of logical thinking. Live long and prosper. But Star Trek did not introduce logic into our earthly orb. What is logic? Our Merriam-Webster dictionary says that it is the science of the formal principles of reasoning. When we think of the origins of logic, we tend to think of ancient Greeks, Aristotle, Pythagoras, Plato. But other parts of the ancient world developed branches of logic independently. It's unlikely the Apostle Paul knew much about logic developed in those far-off lands, but he certainly knew about and had studied Greek logic. In preaching to the Gentiles, he made use of the norms of debate and reasoning in the Greek fashion. And while in Athens, a group of philosophers heard about his teaching and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, a council of sorts that met on a hill near the Acropolis. It was a place where Greeks and foreigners alike would gather to listen and debate new ideas. Paul delivered an important sermon there. Some were swayed by the gospel. Others found it illogical. And when you come to think of it, in many ways, the gospel is illogical. Yet even the half Vulcan Spock found sometimes you must rely on something other than logic. We most likely would call it faith. So today, our sermon is simply titled Illogical. Warning, not watching this service would be illogical. Grace and peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ. Hello, and welcome to the online worship service of Robinson Memorial Presbyterian Church in Gastonia, North Carolina for Sunday, August 20th, 2023. As loyal viewers will know, for several weeks in July and a bit of August. We here at Robinson Memorial have been involved in a mission to collect school supplies for the folks at Robinson Elementary, our next door neighbors. This is the fourth year of our collection effort, each a part of a competition among sister Presbyterian churches in our area. We won the first year against larger competitors. How did we fare in 2023? We'll find out for certain this evening at 6 when we gather in Fellowship Hall at Union Presbyterian Church for a celebration and reveal party. You are invited to join our delegation at the event as together we give God the credit for these gifts and at the same time enjoy desserts brought by attendees. Spoiler alert here, if you don't want to know our totals until tonight, uh, fast forward just a bit. Okay, so this year, Robinson Memorial collected 1,171 items. That deserves some cheers. You 
may recall that this year we had a special emphasis on facial tissue since that's an item for which schools have no funds. Paper towels, sure, toilet paper, yeah, but not facial tissues. Today, I can tell you that we collected 164 boxes of all shapes and sizes. Counting all the tissues inside, we provided enough two and three plies to cover 14,401 sneezes. That's certainly nothing to sneeze at, right? Thank you for your contributions to this year's efforts and hope to see you this evening at Union. Now, I think it's time to get this worship service underway. Let's begin with our responsive call to worship. You'll find the words on your screen. How very good and pleasant it is when families live together in unity. It is like precious oil on the head running down upon the beard of Aaron. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord ordained the blessing upon us, life forevermore. Let us worship God. Today's opening hymn is Praise the One Who Breaks the Darkness. Sing along as Ashley provides the music. Let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for the one who has promised is faithful. With this in mind, let us confess our sins before God. Our source of deliverance, Christ, calls us to faith while we seek our own security. He teaches us to trust him, yet we don't take that risk. He expects total commitment, and we think in terms of percentage. Time after time, we turn our backs on your grace, serving our idols and forsaking our Christ. We rely on your promise in him to redeem us. We are dependent on him who can intercede for us. O oh God, in Christ, have mercy upon us.
And all God's people said, Amen. As God gave manna to the Israelites during their time in the wilderness, we now receive Christ as the bread of life. As God went before the Israelites as a pillar of fire, we now receive the Holy Spirit as a source of comfort and presence. God is consistently in love with those called God's people. As Christ numbers us among those chosen, we have assurance of God's grace and forgiveness. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. We take a moment here to thank you and, praise God, from whom we have received everything. Thank you for your ongoing generosity to the ministry and mission of Robinson Memorial. Without you, we would not be able to continue with these online worship services. At the end of the service, you'll find on your screen our mailing address, website address, and a QR code you can use to get to our secure online giving platform. Whether a little or a lot, your gifts help. Thank you. And now let's give thanks and praise to God for His blessings as we return a part of our treasures to the source of all good things. There are those who would be glad with the crumbs from your table, O God. We have received your gifts in abundance. Make us mindful of those who are needy as we bring you our tithes and our offerings. Use them to ease the pain of those who are suffering. As we serve others, use us to fulfill your will. Amen. Old Testament reading for today comes to us from Genesis chapter 45 verses 1 through 15. Listen now for the word of our Lord. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all of his attendants and he cried out, have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him, because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now, do not be distressed, and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here, because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been famine in the land, and for the next five years, 
There will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household and ruler of all Egypt. Now, hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me. You, your children and grandchildren, your flocks and herds, and all you have. I will provide for you there, because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. You can see for yourselves. And so can my brother Benjamin, that it is really I who am speaking to you. Tell my father about all the honor accorded me in Egypt, and about everything you have seen. And bring my father down here quickly. Then he threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept. And Benjamin embraced him, weeping. And he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. Afterward, his brothers talked with him. Joseph had mercy on his brothers. God has mercy on us, regardless of whether it is logical. As our hymn of preparation, let us sing together the familiar song, Amazing Grace.
Our New Testament reading comes to us from Romans chapter 11, verses 1 through 2a, and then 29 through 32. I ask then, did God reject his people? By no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. For God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. Just as you who were at one time disobedient to God have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. At the end of the first quarter of Super Bowl XXII, back in 1988, prospects for victory looked pretty good for the Denver Broncos with a 10-0 lead over the Washington Redskins. But the Broncos didn't score again in, in the entire game while Washington notched 35 points in the second quarter and added another seven in the fourth quarter. Reportedly, more than 80 million people tuned into the ABC network that evening to watch the game and see Chubby Checker and the Rockettes perform the halftime show. While a number of Bronco fans may have turned off their TVs before the end of the game, Many viewers stuck around for ABC's premiere of a show titled The Wonder Years. The show followed Kevin Arnold as he entered into puberty, surrounded by an older brother and older sister, each with issues of their own. His parents and his friends all amidst the clashing values of life in the late 1960s and early 70s. Not a great time to go through puberty, although I'm not sure when it would have been. The term wonder years seems misused. Illogical years would be more like it. I say illogical because despite all the disputes within the Arnold family, the clashes between the hippie-inspired daughter and her traditionalist father, the antagonism between the bullied big brother and the main character. In the end, they still loved each other, even if they didn't always like each other. Perhaps you know similar families. Are such dynamics logical? Probably not. But then, is it logical for God to love sinners? Is it logical that God still loves those who persecuted and executed his only son? Is it logical that God should seek out and love people beyond those he first called and still, somehow, still love those originally called? And how on earth could Paul's last sentence in today's reading from Romans be logical? For God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. Illogical. The Apostle Paul's confusing declaration comes at the end of three chapters from Romans where he describes the status of the Jewish people in light of the revelation of Christ having come into the world in the form of the man Jesus. Are the children of the promise, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, still loved by God? Did God reject his people, Paul asks, 
quickly providing the answer, by no means. After all, Paul himself was a Jew from the tribe of Benjamin. Yet he 100% knew that God loved him. Why? Because God's love is irrevocable. Irrevocable. Can't be undone or altered. Permanent. Once God loves you, he'll never unlove you. Sure, he may not like us at times, but he will always love us. Is that logical? Probably not. But remember what God said long ago. My ways are not your ways, and my thoughts are not your thoughts. The original intended audience for Paul's letter to the Christians in Rome were Gentiles, people who were not blood relatives of the patriarch Jacob, who was also named Israel. While on earth, we know that Jesus' intended audience was his fellow Jewish people. Yet our Gospels provide examples of his ministering to those outside of the covenant. His final instructions in Matthew were to go to all the people of the world, including Gentiles. Paul became best known as the apostle to the Gentiles. What strikes me about today's passage is the necessary link Paul makes between the disobedience of the Gentiles with the disobedience of the Jewish people. Just as you who were at one time disobedient to God have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. Let's attempt to break down this sentence. You who were at one time disobedient to God. Paul is clearly addressing Gentiles who, despite not being a party to God's covenant made at the foot of Mount Sinai with the Hebrew people, were called to follow Christ. They did not have the law. They knew nothing of the patriarchs and prophets of old. The names of Moses, Samuel, and David carried no meaning for them. They could not claim a birthright to God's promises. They were, therefore, in effect, disobedient to God because they did not know him. But through Christ, God claimed them as his own children and made himself known to them so they could receive his mercy. But why did they receive this mercy? Paul here declares the gift was given to Gentiles because of the disobedience of the Jewish people. They hadn't listened. Instead of adhering to the intent of his commandments, they became so legalistic that the law became their God. Spurned by the very people he had come to rescue, crucified by them, Christ ended up opening his arms even wider to include God's mercy to the Gentiles. But this is not where Paul's argument ends, but rather where things get, shall we say, illogical. They too, that is the Jewish people, have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. Those who sought Jesus' death disobeyed God's intent. But God has mercy on whomever he chooses. His mercy is not exclusive for Jews or Gentiles because 
all have sinned and are in need of mercy. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. This is where the illogical meter registers off the charts. Earlier in Paul's letter, he declared that God wants to show mercy, which led the apostle to question whether that means we should sin a lot more so that we can receive a lot more mercy. Paul says that's absolutely not the case. But no matter how hard we try at being righteous, we'll always need God's mercy. Being recipients of God's mercy leads us, or at least should lead us, to share in that mercy. Just as Joseph shared with his brothers the mercy he had received from God. Let's admit that being a brother of Joseph was probably not the easiest thing in the world. He was their father's favorite and freely shared his fantastical dreams about who he was to become. So when the opportunity came to get rid of Joseph, his brothers jumped at the chance. Not by killing him as originally planned, but by selling him off into slavery in a far-off land. In their mind, that was the end of the story. But we know better. Joseph became a powerful man in, in Egypt, second only to Pharaoh. When his brothers came to him begging, totally unaware of his real identity, Joseph could have exacted his revenge for their betrayal. That would have been a logical response, right? Instead, he showed mercy even though his brothers did not deserve it. Something God does all the time, and we are the beneficiaries. Our Bible is filled with illogical stories. Why would God have put that tree in the Garden of Eden if he didn't want us to eat his fruit? Why would God harden Pharaoh's heart against the Hebrews? Why was Judas Iscariot made one of the twelve disciples? Why would God come into the world in the form of a human only to die on a cross? As a matter of human logic, none of this makes any sense. But earlier in this letter, Paul wrote, We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. It doesn't need to make sense to us. Righteousness comes to us through faith in a God who wants us to be in a healthy relationship with him despite all our flaws, all our sins, despite the limitations of our logic. And it's okay to think it is totally illogical for God to bind everyone over to disobedience so that he can show mercy to them. Who said that true love was ever anything but illogical? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. And now, let us turn our hearts and minds to the Lord in prayer. O God of abiding presence, you stoop to hear the murmuring of your people. You do not desert them in the midst of their fears. You see that they are continually fed. 
and promise that they will always be led. We are your people, called by Christ to the banquet. You heap your mercies upon us and surround us with care. We thank you for how you watch over your children. Through Christ, we inherit your promised deliverance and entrust our lives to you. Hear our prayers as we make our entreaties. Feed us the bread of life that Christ brings. Help us to arise refreshed with the dawn, ready to meet what awaits us. Help us to share what we have in abundance, to be good stewards over what you place in our care. Keep us from greed that inhibits our obedience and give us compassion to respond to others' needs. Oh God, keep us from taking your blessings for granted as though we were entitled to all you give. We have what surrounds us because of your grace. Most gracious Lord, we come to you today with prayers, prayers for Penny that her recovery continues, for Buster and Corinne while they're gone from us, for Terry, for Rick, Matthew, and Andrew, for Palmer, for Darla. We continue our prayers for Lee and Susie, for Isabella and Irene, for Mary Greer, for Barbara Plyler, for Beth Sanders and Marilyn, for Joyce Bell and for Moselle. Gracious Lord, we continue our prayers for Mac and for Pat Button, for Vicki and for Judy, for Lorraine Miller, Jerry, Sandra, Adrian, Doug Ashley, Debbie and Bobby. We pray for Kim and for Alan, for Ted and for Mitchell, for Bill. We pray for Martin and Becky and David, for Tiffany, Michaela, for Johnny Frazier and Kay, for Lorraine and Bruce and Joyce. We continue our prayers for Shirley and for Linda, for Claudette and TC, for Ashley, for Ray and Debbie, for Amber and Sherry, for Morgan and Barbara Moses. We pray for Henry, for Gary, for Josh and for Nancy, for Jane and JC, for Debbie Glenn and for Jake Veldman. And we continue our prayers this week for those victims of fires in Hawaii. Almighty God, you have broken the tyranny of sin and sent the spirit of your son into our hearts. Give us grace to dedicate our freedom to your service, that all people may know the glorious liberty of the children of God through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever, and who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us tell the whole world what it is we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. 
The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We close with a reminder that Jesus doesn't play favorites, but invites all to follow him. Our last hymn of this service is, In Christ There Is No East or West. In Him, true hearts everywhere, their high communion find. His service is the golden cord, close binding all mankind. Thank you for joining us today in worship to the God who calls all to Him. If you found this service meaningful or uplifting, please give this video a like or a thumbs up. Leave a comment. Subscribe if you haven't already, and most importantly, share it with others. Don't forget about the school tools celebration at 6 p.m. at Union Presbyterian. And remember, you can join us in person for worship at 11 a.m. each Sunday or right here online at noon. See you next week. This is God's commandment that we should believe in the name of Jesus Christ and love one another, just as He has commanded us. All who obey His commandments abide in Him, and He abides in them. And by this we know that He abides in us, by the Spirit that He has given us. And now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace now and forevermore. Amen.